And um, it is my uh, privilege to work with our Smart Talks every semester. Uh, how many of you are here for the very first time? You've never been to a Smart Talk before. Welcome. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Uh, so presumably the rest of you have been here and you know why we do the Smart Talks. But let me just tell you briefly, um, in the Honors College, we value the opportunity for interdisciplinary uh, conversation and the uh, chance to interact with people who might be in very different kinds of fields than, than you students and faculty find yourselves. That's one of the, the beauties of being in the Honors College. So in the fall, uh, we organize our uh, Smart Talks around the common reading theme. And that common reading theme is attached to the uh, common reading that we hand out to first year students. So how many of you are first year students in here? Great. So theoretically, you know, and I'm sure 
actually you know, that our common reading this year uh, is In the Shadow of the Banyan. And the theme of that book has to do with dealing with adversity, but also having hope in the midst of the challenge of adversity. So we've had some really terrific speakers so far this semester who've talked about a range of ideas that connect to that theme of adversity and hope. And uh, today we are really privileged to have with us Dr. Monica Casper. Uh, she is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. She's also a professor of Gender and Women's Studies and has an affiliated faculty status in the School of Sociology and Africana Studies. Uh, so she's very well connected on this campus. Uh, she has a range of scholarly and teaching interests and uh, if we had her talk about all of those interests, we could be here a while. Uh, she has expertise in lots of different things. She uh, teaches and does research in the areas of gender, race, bodies, health, sexuality, disability, and trauma. Uh, and is author and, and co-author of a number of books and, and publications. So she's a really um, interesting and, and well, um, uh, a, a person of depth who I'm sure you could have good conversations with about the topic at hand today and about lots of other things. Um, so we are so pleased that she is here to join us today. And um, so please join me in welcoming her as our speaker today. I think I'll start up here, but I might wander. I tend to do that. Um, can you all hear me OK? I'm standing up here just because my voice doesn't travel as well as it could, so I'd like to use the microphone. Um, so this talk is called Elephant Tales, A Lesson in Trauma, and it really is about elephants. Um, I know we talk about elephants metaphorically sometimes, but this is actually about elephants. And um, I know it might seem odd for a sociologist to be studying elephants, but you'll kind of see why I study them as I continue my talk. Um, I did want to say, um, well, thank you. Thank you to Carter and also thank you to Dean Corkadale, who wasn't able to be at the lunch. Um, I think everybody else who was here. So why elephants? So I have long been fascinated by elephants, and I love many, many things about them. How many people here love elephants? Yeah? <laughs> They're very lovable, right? Although most of us probably haven't hugged them in the ways that we hug our lovable creatures. Um, and the things that I love about them, their sociality, the fact that they are like humans in certain ways, even though they're quite different. Um, they love their young, they have the ability to grieve seemingly, they're communicative, they have passed the mirror test. All of these things are things that make them very appealing to many of us. Um, they're sometimes called charismatic megafauna, which is a term I love. Um, it's not a term we use in sociology a lot. We talk about charisma quite differently, <laughs> but it's a way of thinking about their personalities and the ways that they appeal to us. Um, another reason I find them so interesting is that I'm really disturbed by what's happening to them um, as somebody who's long followed environmental politics and conservation and various kinds of things that happen to our planet. I have a book on environmental um, politics and justice that I edited several years ago, so it's been kind of a long-standing theme. And I'm worried about the decimation, history of poaching, and all kinds of things, habitat loss. You know, things that we could talk at length about. I won't say too much about that right now. Um, but they're also theoretically interesting and in ways that connect to some of the other work that I do. Um, and when we ask what's happening to the elephants, it opens up a conversation and the possibility of a conversation about um, how elephants are like us or not like us, right? That puts that on the table. How designations of human and non-human get made. In the broader politics of species management and supply of food and managing um, environmental degradation, what is our role in that? Especially from afar, right? Most of us, I think it's not, but most of us don't go to places where elephants live regularly, right? So I use a term called work objects, which is a term that I um, created many years ago based on Bert Herbert Mead's work, just to think about social objects around which we do work, certain kinds of work. And those objects have meanings for us, and they shape the kinds of work that we do. So elephants, for me, are an intellectual work object in a way that they're not a work object of sanctuary care or veterinary care or other kinds of work. So I have loved elephants for a long time. Um, I haven't been studying them for a long time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the origin story of how I got to the elephants. I teach a course. 
and this is where I might be able to, I can use a hand, do I have a tech person in the room? Are you my tech person? Could you just toggle over to the website momentarily for me? So he's going to do that while I'm chatting. Um, I teach a course, uh, critical, critical trauma studies, basically, um, that I haven't taught here yet. Um, I've taught at ASU. Um, I, know I, I did teach it there. My first year, it was a chaotic year. <laughs> I did teach it. Um, so I, I just wanted to pull it up so you can see where to find the syllabi. I've got all my syllabi online because I think they should be accessible to people. They're not private. You're welcome to look at them. So, um, so it's the two trauma studies <coughs> that you can see. And trauma studies as a field is interesting to me for a number of reasons. Um, interesting history in terms of Holocaust scholarship, um, other kinds of interruptions in social life. Um, thank you. And then you can just pop back. And that's just on my website, which is monicajancaster.com. So you're welcome to go and look at all of that. Thank you. And so we cover a number of things. We cover kind of theoretical and cultural states of trauma, what trauma is, how we understand trauma, how we think about trauma. Um, how trauma enacts itself in our lives, what gets to count as a trauma, and when we designate something as a trauma, then what is our intervention and our reaction to it, our response to it. And the critical part is thinking about the work that the term trauma does as a kind of diagnosis of social life and harm, right? So a lot of things happen to us, but we don't call everything trauma. So we're interested politically and culturally, those of us in this field, and what does get to count as trauma. So naming, What's happening to elephants as a kind of trauma is, a, is also a political move, right? On my part and the part of others. So when I teach this course, one of the things that I do, thank you, you can pop back to me. Thanks so much. Um, is we talk theory, but then we also talk particular topics. So we cover, as you can imagine, all of the pretty known traumas. We talk about the Holocaust, we talk about genocide, we talk about um, mass scale traumas, we also talk about intimate um, traumas, interpersonal or intimate partner violence. We talk about rape, we talk about domestic violence. Um, we talk about militarization of war, right? We talk about traumatic injuries, including brain injury. We talk about PTSD and the history of PTSD. So we cover a lot of things. One of the things that I've been covering in this class is elephants. And there are a couple of reasons why, which I'll, I'll sort of lead into. Um, a, they're, they're facing habitat loss and decimation of approaching and various other kinds of things. They're also in interesting ways, they've become the kind of poster child, the poster animal, if you will, of human studies of trauma. Mm -hmm. So even more so than dolphins or dogs or other kinds of, or, or non-human uh, primates, right? Other kinds of animals that are like us, that are sentient, that are smart, that are social. Um, elephants have really emerged in the human trauma studies literature as the animal of interest, which was surprising to me. Um, and I, I thought that was an interesting intellectual why is this the case? Why is it elephants? So I started digging around a little bit more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and when I teach the course, I typically teach um, sort of conceptually and chronologically. So I try to move historically <coughs> a little bit. And I do a session on lynching in the US South. Um, and then I move into a session on elephants. And you'll see why in, in just a little bit. Um, so that course, sorry, I'm a little white. So that course has prompted certain kinds of research questions for me, even though it started as a class um, many, many years ago. So these are three of the projects that I've been working on. One is on traumatic brain injury. And in that project, I'm collaborating with a number of folks to look at the ways TBI is understood and responded to in the populations of professional athletes and veterans and domestic violence survivors. Um, and what we're looking at are um, the kinds of investments that we're making in each of those areas. And can anyone guess which area we're making the least amount of investment in? Domestic violence, right? We don't talk about it very much. We're not investing and in trying to figure out what is the relationship between violence and TBI. Um, and every clinical study that I've pulled up starts with we don't know enough. We don't know enough. We don't know enough, right? So that's a project. Parental abduction of children. Um, is a project that I've been working on with some former students from ASU. Um, this is when parents kidnap their children, right, which happens sometimes. Um, so we're interested in what that experience is like for the children, particularly adult children now who have been kidnapped as children themselves, right, adults who are now kind of reflecting on that experience. Also, what has happened with shifts in the law. So in the 1970s, there, was, there wasn't there was illegal to kidnap your children. Right? Um, the law has really changed the way that other marital law and other kinds of things have shifted. 
And um, we're also interested in why there's very little sociological research on that question. Um, I'm not going to talk about either of those two in any depth today, but I do want to talk about the elephants. So as I was thinking about um, what it would look like to do a, quote, study of elephants, um, I'm an ethnographer. I'm not an animal person per se. I'm not even someone who's coming out of the kind of interdisciplinary field of animal studies, uh, which is a vibrant field, and there's a lot of cool things happening in that field. Um, I don't think that I can go and talk to the elephants. That's not my plan. I would like to go talk to the elephants if they can step on me. That would be really cool. But you know, I don't envision this as an ethnic ethnography of elephants, right? But what I am good at studying are humans um, and the ways that we create community and social meaning around certain kinds of things. So I'm tentatively calling the project Archiving the Elephant and thinking about the ways that we as human beings archive, right, in that sense of keeping a record of, keeping a history of a species that we're losing. Um, and where do we archive them and how do we archive them and what that looks like. So um, we archive them in photography. You know, I look at the work of Gregory Colbert and others. We archive them in sanctuaries and zoos. We archive them in wildlife preserves. We archive them in we stuff them sometimes, not so much anymore. Um, we archive them in people's um, homes when they kill them for tusks, right? We archive them in churches when ivory is used um, for religious purposes. So, so that's the project um, that's emerging. And this is, of all of the projects, this is the one that I spend the least amount of time on because I'm trying to finish a book, um, but I'm most passionately interested in right now, right? So you're getting to hear some ideas that are not really written anywhere yet. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, keep going back, I'm a Mac person, so this is freaking me out. Um, so just briefly thinking about elephant trauma, the crisis in elephants is increasingly framed as trauma, so I've been tracking media coverage for the last several years um, about like, what's been happening to the elephants. And increasingly we see the language of trauma, right? So that's interesting in a number of ways. We've also seen the emergence trauma as a field, we've seen trauma studies, we've seen the emergence of um, a kind of traumatized nation discourse post 9-11. So there are interesting things about the ways we understand environmental degradation, habitat loss, species loss as trauma, right? So as I said before, I think that's like a kind of biopolitical question. Like what does it mean to say it's a trauma and how are we going to respond to it? Uh, Carol Siever has an interesting piece in the Times where he talks about elephants having PTSD and quote cracking up. Right, they're cracking up as a species. Um, they're behaving strangely. All these interesting things are happening to them. Very disturbing things. Um, neuroscience, of course, is getting on board, which is also happening in all of trauma studies, and it's deeply fascinating. And I'm very interested in working across the aisle with neuroscientists because there are a lot of really fascinating things happening in our investigations of the brain that I, as a sociologist, don't have access to. Right. So I have my own particular methods, people in the sciences have their methods, and I think we can learn from each other about um, what does happen to the brain in trauma. You know, going back to the kidnapped children, what happens to those kids as they grow up? Have their brains actually changed? If so, what does that look like, right? So thinking about the plasticity of the brain. Um, families are being ripped apart, lots of orphaned elephants out there that are being cared for at places like the Sheldrick um, Trust. And elephants are portrayed as Harbingers of harm to humans. And they're not the only species that are framed that way, but if we think about kind of what appears in social media and what we're seeing um, in terms of coverage of environmental issues, because they're, again, charismatic megafauna, they're appealing to us in ways that say the pangolin, right? So they don't even know what the pangolin is, <laughs> are not, right? So um, I have a friend who just finished a book on bees, also facing loss and devastation. People are scared of bees, right? I mean, we might care kind of intellectually about the loss of bees, but we don't really want to pet them or hug them. We kind of want to run from them sometimes. Um, now, elephants, on the other hand, we can be really fond of, right? We can admire them. We can try to save them. Um, and so that's what lots of folks are doing. So I said that I would um, circle back to lynching. So how much time do I have? I'm going to go over. So we get have time for questions. Um, okay, great, great. So this is Mary. Um, and in 1916, she was killed in Kingsport, Tennessee. We actually just went to Kingsport in the spring. Um, we were at a family wedding, a friend's wedding, my family was, and we wanted to visit Kingsport. And there's really nothing there to mark Mary having been lynched. 
in this town. Uh, we walked the railroad tracks, we went into the public library, which is where you usually get information, right? Um, I wrote to the mayor and said, hey, I was just in your town, and it's really a nice little town in Tennessee, and what about Mary the Elephant? And she wrote back, and we had an interesting dialogue. Um, and it's not a particularly nice thing for them to remember, right? So one of the things we look at in trauma studies is what we choose to memorialize, right? And what the costs of memorialization are. Um, for this town, the fact that they killed Mary is not a particularly happy thing. So Mary was um, being handled by a guy named Red Eldridge, and he was very inexperienced. There, um, you know, evidence that he was abusive toward her, that she may have had an injury, either an abscess tooth or something going on with her, her body. And she uh, picked him up in her trunk, lifted him up, and slammed him to the ground. <laughs> Excuse me. And then she kicked him into the crowd. So Mary was not happy with Red Eldridge. Um, a blacksmith then tried to shoot her, tried to fire five rounds into her body, with, which did nothing because elephants have big skins, hence the name, um, so the bullets didn't work. So the owner of the circus, Charlie Sparks, was worried that um, the word would get out, which of course ultimately it did anyway, and that he wouldn't be allowed to travel with the circus. So they traveled by train, this is pre-internet, obviously, you know, pre lots of things. Um, so it was very exciting for people to come to the circus when they were arrived. So they decided that she needed to be publicly executed. So they took her to Irwin, Tennessee, um, <clears throat> hung her from a crane on a railroad derrick while crowds were shouting, um, kill the elephant, kill the elephant. And the first time they tried to hang her, which is obviously a very big animal, failed, and she fell and she allegedly broke her hip. Um, and then they strung her up and hung her with a thicker chain and then she died. So it, it's a tragic tale. It's a bizarre tale, um, but I also think that it tells us something about what I call technologies of trauma, because what they chose to ultimately kill her with was the technology of lynching, and I think that that's important to talk about um, in the American South in 1916, right? So if we think about the technologies that are available to us to do certain kinds of harm to people, lynching was a widely available technology, particularly to handle the, quote, non-human other. Right, which is precisely how African Americans were portrayed in the American South. So this is just a, a lynching map of the United States. <clears throat> of lynchings that had occurred through 1961. Um, and you can see this sort of concentration in the South. So there's a question there for me. Um, it's not a question that says lynching existed, therefore causally they lynched Mary, but it's a, it's a provocation, right? What are the technologies available to us? make a statement of some kind. And the statement had to be made that, that Mary was harmful and she needed to be put down. So what did lynching do? Lynching helped create and maintain a social order of white supremacy and human exceptionalism, with human understood in relation to other animals and non-persons in hierarchical ways, right? Slavery was very much about demonization and othering. othering. And there are historical meanings as well um, about human superiority to all other animals that operate in a kind of racial logic. Right? So the, those of us who do this sort of human, non-human work understand that some of this is already about race and racism and racial logics. So in the afterlife of lynching, right, although some would say that part of the work of Black Lives Matters right now is to really address what is contemporary lynching practice, right, in terms of police violence, um, I'm interested in putting some things side by side. And these might not be standard things that you might stick side by side to look at, just thinking horizontally. What does it mean to lynch a person in an elephant in the U.S. South at a particular historical moment? What does that tell us? Um, and then thinking vertically and longitudinally, is there something about lynching that can help us think about poaching? Is that too much of a leap, right? So what is the logic of lynching and what is, it, what is its afterlife? And how is poaching and the kind of slaughter of elephants both like and not like lynching? So this is my, one, my second gruesome picture, I'm sorry. Just a picture of a poached. Um, elephant. Um, and the elephants are poached because people want their ivory, right? There's a massive trade in ivory. And I would suggest that poaching is also a technology of trauma, right? Like lynching, it's a technology that produces trauma, right? That's embedded in particular social relations. And then just some numbers about poaching. They estimate about 100 elephants are killed daily. The massively expensive, busy market that hasn't really been helped that much by. Um, regulations, right, and the kinds of things that some countries are doing. And there are some, there's a little bit of hope on the horizon, it's not all clear, but 
Um, here the ivory trade is brown, and it's kind of the eight nations who are um, exporters, and there are middlemen and consumers. So the economics of poaching, right, has to be part of this story. This is transnational, it's the flow of goods and money, it's the flow of people. It's also the flow of monetaries. And one of the kind of surprising things for me in starting to look at this is not just that the, the um, poachers are militarized, right? They have high-tech weapons now, they have drones, they have all kinds of things, but the anti-poaching efforts are highly militarized. So poaching <laughs> and trying to fix poaching has become this very militarized operation. Um, and as somebody interested in how we invest our resources and where, that's an interesting <clears throat> question too, right? That this has become so militarized. Um, and people put lots of things on my Facebook page all the time. And a recent one is, a recent few actually have been profiling women rangers who are engaged in anti-poaching. Um, and they're sharing it with me because they know a lot of elephants and this issue, but they also are saying, look, women are making it in this sort of anti-poaching world, right? It's a gender equality thing. And that's kind of interesting. Too, <laughs> because it is, they are making it, but right in this military space, what does that mean? Um, so there's been a lot of um, ivory seizures and burning of ivory, of ivory um, that, that's happened. So it's kind of an ongoing story. This is not history, right? This is something that we're kind of in the middle of. And when you study a project that you're in the middle of, the statistics change regularly. The you know new countries get involved, old countries get out of the way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about. Um, kind of how we think about what we're making as we think about poaching as a kind of technology of publishing. Um, so one thing that we make, of course, are the elephants, right? So a number of sanctuaries and facilities are working with the birds and the babies. And I looked very closely at the Sheldrick um, Trust, which was um, created by Dame Daphne Sheldrick. And the way that she already might written, I have written about this, you can find that on my, my page, um, the way that she's organized care for the babies, um, she does rhinos as well, and elephants, is that the, she hires only men to do this work, because she doesn't think that women can commit to, because of their own families, the kind of laborious caregiving required. So each elephant is paired with a caregiver for several years. And that person is essentially raising this baby elephant. And so what she's done is she's kind of reproduced the bonds of sociality, right? Have been ruptured by the poaching of the, the mother, um, which is very interesting. <clears throat> so, a couple of responses to elephant trauma that, that I've looked at um, in terms of the archiving question. Um, so, there's a narrative that elephants are need of rescue right now from some humans by other humans, right? I mean, that's the narrative of animal rescue, right? That we see even with um, postings about dog shelters. Right? There's a rescue narrative out there. And I call these kind of the three S's and the two R's. So sanctuary, salvation, and safety. And then rescue and rehabilitation. And I will say, I mean, I think these places do incredible work. I love the work that they're doing. I financially support some of them, which makes Bill really, really nervous. <laughs> when I write through a website, he's like, are you donating anything on that site right now? Um, but I also have a kind of sociological distance in that sense that I want to say, if we're doing rescue and rehabilitation work in a framework of trauma, what does that mean? What does it mean for the elephants? What does it mean for us? What kind of story are we telling ourselves about the kind of planet we want to be on? What other interventions might be possible if we weren't framing it in those ways? Um, and that's not to suggest that we should necessarily frame it differently, but it's to ask questions about that work. Um, because certain things happen at these sanctuaries and at these facilities. Right, that we need to look at and ask ourselves questions about. Um, so this is a picture of the Shelter Trust. You can see the elephants follow their guys around. The guys wear these green things, these green jackets. Um, it's very touching. <coughs> I'm deeply touched by these all the time, and I want to go desperately and visit them. Um, but I also have questions about gender and race and our investments in certain parts of the world. Right. So those things are part of the story as well. How am I on time? Do I have time for? A little tiny detour, right? So, so I'm going to take a slight detour. Oh, no, I forgot about Prince Charles. I mean, Prince William. <laughs> Prince William has decided that elephants are his thing, um, as have a number of other celebrities. Um, elephants have become a kind of species du jour. And then Prince William recently um, let the Chinese know that they needed to change their behavior or else that there would be no elephants by the time his daughter is 25. 
just a little bit delicate because the Chinese are trying to be really deeply connected with the UK right now, and I'm sure you know there's some kinds of things. So apparently Prince William is not, not allowed to meet with the Chinese anymore, which um, <laughs> is really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I admire that they're doing this work, of course, but it's, again, fascinating to me that, um, you know, the heir to a deeply colonialist and imperialist nation, right, that actually sunk roots into some of the places where elephants live is now engaged in this rescue and recovery work. And I think that has to be part of the story as well, in terms of how we can read that about that. So just a tiny little detour, <clears throat> which is that sometimes when I talk about the many projects I'm involved with, people say, what does elephant death have to do with infant mortality? Like, you're all over the map. You don't really settle on any one project. Well, lo and behold, it turns out elephants do have something to do with infant mortality. So you can imagine how excited I was to read this um, particular report where you can actually connect the two projects. Um, and by the way, they are connected in terms of harm. They are interested in harm to creatures, whether they're women or infants or elephants. So there is a kind of thread. But um, this interesting study, which is that um, human infant mortality in and around the sites that they're looking at, which is used as a proxy for poverty and also national well-being, <coughs> excuse me, um, is also connected to elephant poaching. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? Because putting aside the kind of high-tech, um, wealthy folks behind some of the poaching, the, the men and women on the ground who are engaged in it are people who simply would like to make some money, right, for their families in areas of economic deprivation, where, of course, infant mortality is probably so, so there is a little bit of a connection there. Um, particularly if we think about poverty and if we really think about poaching in terms of um, the economic, economic factors. Um, so just in terms of wrapping up a little bit, um, differences that matter. So I've kind of thrown a bunch of ideas at you, including the idea that lynching and poaching might be very similar, which might make some of you a little nervous and others might be thinking of something <coughs> interesting. Um, so I want to just say lynching and poaching are both quite deliberate deaths, right? They're not accidental deaths. They're deliberate. They're for a particular purpose. Um, one is economic, one is punishment, slash power, white supremacy control. Um, they're also preventable deaths, right? Um, we can prevent infant mortality. We're not doing it correctly right now, but we can prevent it. We can also prevent poaching. How would we do that? The more AK-47s? Or is it something else? I think those are questions we're about. Um, and they also get at questions of killing and letting die, which um, for me are imbued in all of the work that I do. It's a deeply Foucauldian question. Many people know Michelle Foucault's work, right? Who do we kill? Who do we let die? Same questions I ask about reproductive justice, right? Why are the black babies dying? More than white babies. That's a deeply political question in the United States, right? It's not simply natural causes. Um, so this killing and letting die was reliant on reproduced systems of geopolitical, economic, and cultural emission inequality. And they also continue to reproduce this meaning of sort of non-human and human. Who gets to count as a human being, right? And if you get to count as a human being, right? And not every person does get to count as a human being, sadly. You know, and historically, we also know it contemporarily um, in all sorts of places. Then what does that mean for everyone? What does that mean for who we are as a people? And what happens in places where animals are now persons? So in India, dolphins are persons. They've decided that, right? What if we were to decide that elephants are persons? What would that mean? That's an interesting thing. Um, there's some interesting work in non-human rights, right, that should have us all thinking. And I would suggest that race, race and species, these kind of two sides of the same coin, are actually really central to both of these processes. So just some questions. Whose bodies do we string up? Whose bodies and lives do we invest in and save? While we're saving elephants, who aren't we saving? Right? I have a, I'm involved in a number of different political projects, including Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And so I have a lot of Facebook feeds about elephants and a lot of Facebook posts about Black Life. And sometimes they intersect, particularly when some of my colleagues in the activist movement say, I can't actually be bothered with your elephants right now, or your dogs, or your dolphins, because Black people are making I get that, right? I get that. <laughs> um, but I also think they're connected and interesting ways that we should talk about. And then really how um, how do race species, human and non-human, live in the 21st century? 
together, what bodies do they live in? Um, again, who do we let live and who do we kill? And this is my former student, Brun, um, who is a global uh, social justice and human rights student at ASU and got to go apparently frolic in the water with this lovely elephant. Um, and that is me in the airport in, I believe, Amsterdam. And they have the Elephants on Parade. Sip it, I don't know about that, but um, there's a website, Elephants on Parade. And they have new elephants that they make, or little tchotchkes that you can buy and, and have a couple in my house. Again, we'll get spending our own my good elephants. Um, but they donate proceeds. Um, I'm going to stop with that. Thank you. Time for questions that uh, have come up for you as, as you've been listening to Dr. Casper. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about how um, elephants are like behaving differently, and then you know, mm -hmm. that's what you. Um, I was wondering, like, what those differences were. Like, what kind of behaviors were you seeing? So, so what I'm seeing in the literature is that elephants are um, they're going places they haven't been before. They're being more aggressive than we've seen them be. They, um, there's evidence that some of the, the bulls, the young males, um, the teenage males, are attacking young species. So there's a case that Sieber talks about of a, a bull elephant attacking a rhino. So just some things that seem unusual to people who study animal behavior. So that's the kind of stuff. I was just curious if you had any thoughts on why the demand for ivory is going up. Why it's going up? So, ivory, ivory, ivory. So, there are a lot of wealthy Chinese who are buying ivory. So, that's a problem. Um, it's a problem that's being addressed inside the country and outside the country in different ways. Um, one of the biggest markets is religious use. So, Catholic countries, right, where a lot of ivory gets used in a lot of things. Right, materials that are used in religious ceremonies and services. Um, those are big markets. So if you remember my map of like the exporters and the importers, a lot of the countries that are importing are um, countries that have um, high prevalence of Catholicism. So that's a thing too. Has the Pope weighed in on it all? Or has he been invited to weigh in? That's interesting. I mean, you know, with his emphasis on human rights yeah. and on changing, I think, the Lord. image of the Catholic Church. Yeah, I, I should write to him. You should. Do you see an email address? Your phone. <laughs> <laughs> he has a Twitter I email everybody. Tweet him. I'm not on Twitter now. Oh, well. <laughs> like one, so everybody right now, tweet the Pope and say, what do you think about ivory? I think it's a great question. I mean, maybe. You know, he weighs on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have, I've not seen anything. It doesn't mean he hasn't, but um, I just haven't seen it. Yeah. More questions? Tom? Um, Africa's huge. Mm -hmm. And the elephant mm -hmm. conservation topic has been going on for quite a few yeah. decades. It's very contentious. Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that happens is because in your map, when you looked at the exporters, chief exporters are, as you point out, some of the poorest countries in Africa, yeah. Cambodia, for example, and Kenya. But at the other end of Africa, in the southern end, there's an overpopulation of mm -hmm. elephants. Um, and that, in turn, can create behavioral mm -hmm. uh, aberration, as mm -hmm. you see. But I've, I've been the those places where it's coming into the Botswana, near the Botswana border, where I've been surrounded by thousands of elephants mm -hmm. and, and can't move. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of habitat destruction associated with that overpopulation of elephants, mm -hmm. other species being disturbed as a result. One of the things that's been done is culling herds. Right. And would you care to go into, I don't know if that's the term people might be familiar with here, if you don't mind describing what's involved with that. Yeah, so so essentially they're organized kills of elephant birds, right? Um, from helicopter or some other way. Um, and they have a usually a quota, presumably, of how many they want to take out. Can I use that term? Um, yeah, and you're right. I mean, there are different places and some. And so what we see, so the other interesting question for me is what do we see in terms of what's represented to us as the problem on the ground, right? So what we don't see is an overabundance in certain places. Um, and I think that's a really interesting political question, too. I mean, I don't want to be the person to go in and tell folks how to manage the elephants. I'm interested in looking at how they're managing the elephants, right? Like, what are our technologies? What are the issues um, of species relationships in those communities, right? When you have too many of something, um, 
right? And I also grew up in Wisconsin. You have a lot of deer up there. I'm not a hunter, but I never minded eating venison sausage because it's delicious and um, there are a lot of deer. So I think those are just like these interesting kind of ethical political conundrums. Um, but yeah, it's very big. And I don't, um, I don't think in this, I mean, so we do talk about African elephants and Asian elephants. I think that's too much of a binary for what's happening on the ground, right? So I try to be as specific as possible. Yeah, but I do read some of the descriptions of calling. Right? It, it, it does disturb, right? I mean, as somebody reading about elephants being killed, so I need to kind of think about my own affect in relation to these projects that, I'm, that I work on. Yeah. But Bill says you're going to take us to Namibia, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're on the hook for that trip. <laughs> That'd be great. It would be great. Yeah, we'd love that. There is, um, there, in 2013, there was yeah. a letter to the uh, Vatican um, from a voice for elephants wow. and the response saying that they are against the massacre of elephants, but um, it, it goes on and on and on like lots of time. So, but there has been a response from the Vatican, but I think it's pre uh, Pope okay. Francis. Okay. So, thank you for checking. That's I love that question. Yeah. Other things? One of the things you were talking about is the economic constraints mm -hmm. that push people to see ivory as a economic resource. Um, what kinds of ideas would you have for addressing the underlying economic conditions that might push people who otherwise might not be ivory poachers to do such a thing? Wow, that's a really hard question, partly because I'm not, I'm not an Africanist, I'm not an, econom I mean, I'm an economist, like I'm not, I don't have the skills, I mean that's more Bill's territory to think about like well, how we might develop in certain parts of the world and ways that don't reproduce colonialism, like I think that that's a, a loaded question. I will say that, um, so there's a woman in town that I've been working with um, on a project she wants to do in, um, in Asia, you know, in terms of kind of education, and what she wants to target um, middle, kind of I would call them kind of middle income and middle sized businesses and small businesses. Um, to try to see if she can convince them through some kind of something, I'm not sure what this is going to look like yet, um, to not sell, sell the ivory in their stores. Um, but what would they have to sell instead? So she's thinking about, and she's an MBA, she's thinking about, you know, like how to provide something that would be lucrative for them to have buy in. I think that's interesting. <coughs> um, you know, and, and she, when she and I talk, I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm very pragmatic. I'm from Chicago. I come from the sociological tradition of what we call pragmatism, American pragmatism. So I'm a pragmatic person. Um, I have a lot of pie in the sky ideologies, <laughs> but at base, like I'm about workable solutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, meeting people where they are. So another um, person who does really excellent work is um, a woman who founded the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee, Carol. And now she has founded Elephant Aid International. And her work is retraining mahouts to work with elephants in a way that is actually better for the elephants and doesn't deprive that person of their livelihood. Those are smart things to me, right? Like you're not going in and saying, Americans to the rescue, we're gonna like pet all the elephants and take them to the US and we're gonna, you know, that's not gonna work, right? So I think it's that attentiveness to like, how do we not reproduce certain kinds of historical problems when we go to these other places to do certain kinds of things. Yeah. So. Time for maybe one more question. Anyone has one? Do you have time to stick around and people would like to speak yeah, a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, that was really interesting and, and really embodies the kind of inter interdisciplinary thinking we're trying to yeah. encourage our students to undertake. So yeah, thank you for thank sharing you. Thank about you. your research with us. Go ahead. Thank you.